everybody has adversity and heartbreak and difficulty. And sometimes the lemons are raining from the sky. And so the question is, how do we make lemonade? You can adapt to new habits and it will increase your brain capacity and it will serve your body well. When difficulty comes our way, the, the natural human instinct is to go down the, the line of what if, what if, what if, and we can kind of imagine the worst possible outcome. And one of the things that we learned early on in our journey, of course ours was cancer, everybody's journey is gonna be different, but I do wanna just pass this on because I think it can really help to settle a lot of that anxiety about the future, go with what you know. Yeah, this is a tale, a tale, oh yeah, a tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one, bringing the best of dental knowledge, and we do it all with ease. We cover oral health and screening, and preventing gum disease. We're gonna do a lot of learning, and have a little bit of fun working at the dentist. Tale of Two Hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, an Endeavor Business Media production. This is episode number 378. I'm your host, Andrew Johnston, and thank you so much for joining us today. We have another spectacular show for you as we bring back Karen Davis. She has been a great educator for the profession for a really long time now, and in recent years, her life has thrown her some absolute lemons. And so in this episode, we talk about how is she handling that? What are things that we can do to overcome these lemons when they're tossed to us as well? Because you know what? We're all going to take one on the chin, but we need to keep going. And so how are we responding to challenges? How is that shaping you as a person and those people that are around you? I can't say enough good things about Karen, and I cannot wait for you to get to know her better. And then next week, we bring on Dr. Mike Zubiak to talk about his journey with airway and sleep and what he's learning in the second half of his career. It's pretty interesting how he pivoted. He loves hygienists. He has nothing but great things to say about us, and it's an episode that you're not going to want to miss. So please take a minute, hit that subscribe button on your podcast app, and if you have a few extra minutes, please leave a review. I'd really, really, really appreciate that. So one last thing, it's really cool also, you might have noticed that there are no more ads running for RDH Under One Roof for 2023 on the podcast, and that is because we are critically close to selling out the conference in Nashville. Probably one of the last times I'll say this for the year, and I really can't put more emphasis on this than I am right this minute, but you need to sign up now if you plan on attending this summer's best dental hygiene conference. Head over to rdhunderoneroof.com, sign up now. If you wait just even a couple of weeks, there's probably not going to be any space left. So thank you everyone for listening. Have a great week and enjoy this episode with Karen Davis. A tale of two hygienists. Welcome everybody into the interview portion of the podcast. I am joined by the Karen Davis, one of my favorite people in dentistry, someone who exudes positivity in times that maybe most people would not be exuding positivity. I thank you for being here and, and welcome to the show again. Andrew, thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. It's been a while since I've done this and I'm yeah. very excited to address the audience because I know you have such an amazing following. Well, thank you. I mean, we're very fortunate. We have amazing people like you <laughs> come on and, and, and spread the word of, of what we're doing. Now, the last time you were on, remind me, we talked about, was it sugar? Was that the, the oh big... heavens? Do I remember? Gosh, I, Maybe. I think that I feel like that's where it was. If like, that kind of was like the, the if that was the case, and, yeah, that like was that. a long time ago. So I'm glad I'm back. Yeah, I mean, it was it was like 2018, 2019, <laughs> and I remember the reason why I remember that though is very specifically one I recorded. If you remember, on my lunch break at my dental office, <laughs> and it was the most awkward. Like people were coming in and out of the room, and I was like this is my first time like meeting Karen. She's going to think that I'm such a fool. Like, please just don't judge me on this. Um, and please just like know the value of that. I have in my heart for you and all these different things. And, and like, I respect you. I'm not trying to be rude. And I, I, I was so that anxious and nervous. Hilarious. And then we got great feedback on that episode. That was one of the ones where we realized, I mean, not that we didn't have educational content before, but we realized like when we have guests on that have really good educational content, the audience responds. Oh, uh, so yeah. Like, okay. You're going to, you were using you as like a little pivot point of, <laughs> of what we're doing. So thank you for all of that. Well, seriously. Absolutely. Wow. 
So one thing that I would like to do before we get into kind of our topic today is kind of just a refresher with our audience of who you are and kind of what you've done in you know your career, which is a lot, just kind of refresher for everyone. Okay. Well, yeah, that's easy to do. I love starting with this because I am still practicing. I am practicing in a dental office that I have been in for 37 years. That is just a just an astounding number. But I love that I'm still doing it. I've been on a leave for the past year, but I start back March 15th and I'm really looking forward to it. It's my second family. I obviously am in a really great practice or I wouldn't still be there. So I feel like I am very, very spoiled as a dental hygienist because it's such a great environment. And yet I decided early on in my career that I probably wanted to do something in the speaking world. I was at a dental meeting myself early in my career, and I remember hearing the speaker talking on, are you ready for this, dental insurance, of all things. But <laughs> she was making it really interesting, and I thought, that looks fun. Which is such a hard thing to do, right? I know, <laughs> no, dental I know. Insurance. <laughs> but it, it just kind of stuck in my mind, that looks fun. I think I might be interested in that at some mm-hmm. point. But I didn't pursue it. it. When I started in this dental practice in 1985, the dental practice itself was hosting CE courses. And so when they hired me, they said, hey, we want you to do these little breakout groups with dental hygienists. Would you do that? Sure, tell me what to do, sounds fun. (laughs) And so from that, then I kind of was invited to study club meetings. Hey, could you come and share with the study club? And long story short, it took me a long time to figure out that I really wanted to pursue this as my career. And I did it where it felt like I was jumping off of a cliff, honestly, because I was a single mom and I had decided that I needed to bring in more income and I did not know if this was going to work or not work. So I gave up my full-time position, my full-time benefits. I embarked upon a year to create my content, my business. And I jumped in with both feet, really honestly, having to swim because I didn't have a choice. And I'm really grateful that I was mentored by some important people, my boss being one of them. He was a speaker in the dental profession at that time, Tom McDougall. And he was just an amazing support and mentor for me. And so my career has been blessed with I've done in office consulting. I have my own company and I still see patients. So I feel like I'm just living the dream. I said, yeah, you have like all of the the sweet spots in there. That's right. I, I want to I want to touch a cu- on like a couple of things, not to belabor the point too much, but it feels like that the journey that you took, the hours and hours and hours of developing the content before you launched the content, I feel like that's almost getting to be a rarity now. I feel like a lot of people are oh. assuming how easy it is, and they just start you know speaking and then creating the content after they start speaking. Have you noticed that shift? Well, it's interesting that you bring that up. I mean, I've noticed a lot of shifts in my long career of Mm -hmm. being on the speaking circuit, so to speak. For me, I always knew, A, I wanted to be authentic, so I would never be on the stage if I weren't in patients' mouths. That was a commitment I made day one. So Mm -hmm. whenever I finally do walk away, you'll know I am not in patients' mouths because (laughs) I needed to be authentic. But for me personally, Andrew, I knew that I wouldn't be authentic and valuable if it wasn't also evidence-based. So for me to be evidence-based, I knew I had to do my due diligence and I knew it took a lot of research on various topics. Plus at that point, I really didn't know how to create visual PowerPoint. And I mean, I go back now and look at some of those from that many years ago. It's like, oh gosh, that was horrible. I was probably putting my audiences to sleep. At the, <laughs> at the time, no, it was probably cutting edge at the time. Just like you can't compare those to, you know, now and to there because it's like, the tools that you have now are just so amazing. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. but to your point, I appreciate speakers that do a blend of what resonates with them, what they're passionate about, and bringing in evidence as well. I think we still yeah. need to really provide good evidence because there's so much hearsay out there and a lot of misinformation. Oh, absolutely. And that's yeah. one of the reasons why I like you so much. You have, you oh. have just such great, great energy, but also great information. Thank you. What are you looking forward to most in coming back now that you're Coming back to the clinic part of it. Well, this will not surprise you at all. I only wanted to work a half a day. I know, I, I know. But l- I'm an old hygienist, okay? Okay, I'm an old hygienist. <laughs> only so- 37 years practicing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that wasn't my first job. <laughs> 
<laughs> but at any rate, um, yeah. I wanted just to to come back, work so it's easy for me, not physically demanding and stressful. And so I spaced my patients out with plenty of time to actually reconnect with them. I mean, if you can imagine, right. most of these patients I've been seeing for a really long time. We all yeah. have relationship. In fact, I'm having dinner tonight with a patient of mine. Don't you love it? I do love it. Yeah. So I, what I'm most looking forward to is not only do I get to get hugs and love from all these patients because I've had so many following me on my difficult journey, but I get to hear what's going on in their lives because I, it, I've lost contact with all of these patient friends and I don't know what's going on with them. So yes, the dentistry is important. I love doing what I do with that or I wouldn't be doing it. But the connections, it's just the connections. I cannot wait. I, I've already seen who my first patients are for the first you know, three months out. And it's like, yay, I'm so excited. You're giddy. You're like, yes, I get to do that. Yeah, I know. Okay, but wait, I, there was one or two names. And I went, oh, you're like, why, I'm gonna be didn't, sick that hour. why didn't they go to somebody else's <laughs> schedule? <laughs> They've been waiting for you to come back. And you're just like, evidently. Oh, I, I thought I avoided them. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, I, well, look, we all, I think we all feel that of way. Of course. It, it is one of the things that I do miss about, you know, working in Washington and, and working in those clinics for, you know, years on end is I would have those regulars that I just absolutely loved. And then, yeah. you know, you just, you, you can't replicate those feelings and those emotions and the impact that you have on someone's life like that's just, it's hard to replicate. So and if you're not seeing them regularly. Right. But I think, you know, we're kind of dancing around kind of like the, the elephant in the room a little bit. Mm. You spoke it. Chicago midwinter. And I think your topic was something about making lemonade out of lemons. Is that correct? You've had a difficult, I mean, several, several years. And I want to kind of maybe dive into that topic a little bit and have you tell us a little bit about kind of what you've been going through and what lessons you've been learning. Okay. I'll get emotional. So just heads up. I will too. So if I start crying (laughs) too, don't worry about it. (laughs) Yeah. Because this year has been a year like none other I've ever experienced. And what's interesting is when I decided I wanted to do this making lemonade from the lemons of life topic, David, my husband, was still in in really good health and our quality of life together was still really good. Yes, he had cancer. That's a whole nother component of it. But we had been navigating the cancer journey for 14 years. So we kind of knew what that was about. And Thankfully, he was navigating it well and we were doing life together and it was great. But I I really had planned, Andrew, to have a big party at Chicago and retire. And so I thought if I'm going out, I want to leave my colleagues with some lessons I've learned the hard way from the lemons of life that we've been dealing with because here's where it's going to get emotional. But the best lemonade maker on the planet was my husband who passed in November. And I knew I wanted to share that information while he was still living. And then I was going to celebrate and we were going to retire. But you know what's interesting about life? You just don't see things coming. And yet there's purpose behind everything. And so when David's health changed in April, this lemonade course was the last thing on my mind. So by the time his health had changed and we went through unbelievable difficulty, which is, again, a whole nother layer of reality that I learned about being in the, being dependent upon the medical system and the the good, the bad, and the ugly of that. And yet when I finally wrapped my brain around, okay, now I need to focus on this content, suddenly it's more authentic than I ever imagined it would be. And so it was, it was good for me to create the content because it's literally a tribute to David Sandlin, who just filled up my heart to overflowing for 21 years. And yet he dealt with some of the biggest lemons of life over and over and over. And I sat next to him and took a lot of notes. And I knew I wanted to share this information with my colleagues because everybody has adversity and heartbreak and difficulty. And sometimes the lemons are raining from the sky. And so the question is, how do we make lemonade? But life is hard, Andrew. And the other thing I wanted to acknowledge to my colleagues, COVID was really hard on dentistry and it still is. We're still trying to recover from the 
40% of practices in this country looking for personnel. Oh my gosh, that changes everything. And just the reality of walking back into those treatment rooms and treating patients after everything has changed. Nothing is is the same as it was before the pandemic. And so even if we're not talking about just life hitting us hard, the pandemic hit dentistry hard. And so I wanted to acknowledge that to my colleagues and say, you know, everything I'm talking about today about the, the lemonade recipe that I share is applicable inside the dental treatment room and outside. Yeah. So would you like to know the recipe? I would love nothing more. (laughs) Okay. Well, before I can share the recipe, I have to give just a little bit of backstory because the recipe only makes sense if you understand the lemons. So the first part of the story is not actually a lemon. It is a miracle. The, the meeting of Karen and David, how we ever met together, all had to do with dentistry. We met because his brother is a dentist. My best friend, Kim Miller, was at a dental conference. They are meeting and talking, and they just somehow talk about family. And Kim realizes that Randy has a brother who's a single dad in Dallas. Kim thinks, I've got a friend who's a single mom in Dallas. And so unbeknownst to David or me, they decide we should meet. And so, of course, when Kim Miller runs this idea by me, I say, no way. That's too (laughs) weird. (laughs) So, you know, life goes on. And then I actually, several months later, I meet David's brother, Randy, at a dental meeting that I'm speaking at in Destin, Florida. Do you think that was an accident? It was not. (laughs) (laughs) So Randy comes up with this charming Alabama accent and introduces himself as the friend that, you know, has the brother in Dallas and, and yeah, I'm enjoying talking to him. And I just think, okay, okay, I'll go back and meet this guy. So I meet David in Dallas and we have lunch. No, we don't have lunch. We have appetizers. Appetizers are safer than lunch. So we do appetizers. We meet together. You know, you might need to bail. You never know. We meet together and... Pretty early on, I'm just, I'm really authentic with this guy. I just think, okay, I have nothing to hide here. I've had two failed marriages. You need to know that right from the beginning. I'm not really, you know, a good picker at this. Obviously, this hasn't worked out too well. So, you know, here it is. And without even breaking a smile, David Sandlin looks across the table from me and he says, well, maybe you've seen a bumper sticker around town that says honk if you've been married to David Sandlin. (laughs) (laughs) and so I knew immediately I like this guy a lot (laughs) and so when we left three hours later I I was giddy I literally called my sister in my car and I said Diane I just met someone I could marry and Andrew I've been a single mom for seven years I was fully committed to just raising my daughter on my own that was okay And yet I am giddy because I've just met the most amazing person and I knew it immediately. And so I love what's so sweet about what David shares. When he was driving home, he said the tears are just rolling down his face because he knew at that moment he had met the person that a friend of his at church had been praying for him to meet. Not someone perfect, but someone perfect for him. And she had told him that months and months and months ago. And she said, it's going to happen. Just tell me when it happens. And he knew that day. So, oh my gosh, our love story started day one. And it just got sweeter and sweeter every single year. We would often joke that because we both had so many failed marriages that we didn't have to raise that bar really high to be ecstatically happy. (laughs) Truly, it was more than that. We were given a gift from God that just was extraordinary. Another chance for both of us to pour into each other's lives. And so six years after we married, when he was diagnosed with pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer with metastasis to the liver, that was a blow. We didn't know much about neuroendocrine cancer. It is a different version of pancreatic cancer. It tends to grow at a slower rate. But make no mistake, that is a very deadly cancer as well. But because it grows at a slower rate, you sometimes have ways to treat it and reset the clock. But the problem with rare cancers is there's less black and white treatment options. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we knew that our bonus day started that day, uh, July 16th, 2008, with his diagnosis. Every day after that was a bonus day. And we knew that. And so we lived intentionally that way. And David Sandlin has undergone so many surgeries. In fact, he he not only underwent just horrific surgeries and, and had complications in 2008, but then in 2012, we get the news from the oncology team that there's there's really nothing else. And so, ooh, those are hard words to hear. But once again, God just opened up another miracle and David was able to go to Miami and receive a five organ transplant in August of 2013. He was number 16, Andrew, number 16 of people that have undergone a multi-visceral organ transplant for pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer. And we didn't know if it would work. We didn't know if he'd find a donor match. And I'm so grateful to the family that gave that gift of life because it extended David's life from 2013 to 2022. And those were beautiful years, just jam packed with so many moments. Oh my gosh, so grateful, so grateful. So his lemonade has been coming hard and fast for a long time, but I I always was an admirer and um, just kind of amazed at how he navigated this. I mean, even to the very end when he's in hospice and I know he's not feeling well, and I'll ask him, Dave, how's your pain? You know, they always give you that pain question in the hospital. Is it a one or is it a 10? So Dave, how's your pain? You go, oh, it's probably an eight. What? <laughs> and you're just sitting there? Uh, if, if I were at an eight, my neighbors would know. Oh, my gosh. So, you <laughs> yeah, know, he, exactly. he, he just decided I want to focus on all the good things because I know my days are probably numbered. And he did that. And so the lemonade recipe, here it is. I am actually going to give you the recipe. Here's what I learned from David. Be present always and learn to savor the good stuff. Savor it by pushing away all the other distractions and just being in the moment. And he did that so well. The other part of the recipe was using your mind as a tool, being mindful. David knew from day one, that a lot of his experience with his journey would depend upon his mind. What is his mind going to do with this this horrific information? Oh, no, the cancer is growing again. Oh, no, we don't have any other options. Oh, no, now we have to undergo an abdominal transplant of all your organs. Don't know if that's going to work or not. Let's give it a shot. Oh, no, now the cancer's back after the transplant. Oh, gosh, now we're going to have to go to Germany for treatment. That treatment's not available here. I mean, you get the picture. And and every step of the way, early on in his journey, he decided, I'm going to focus on the good things. David must have known all about neuroplasticity long before I really started learning (laughs) about neuroplasticity, that you can change the thought processes and you can adapt to new habits and it will increase your brain capacity and it will serve your body well. So David knew that health and wellness was somewhat contingent upon how he navigated this journey. And he focused on things that really helped him be in a positive space, practice mindfulness, prayerfulness. I mean, David really did use his mind as a very positive tool. The nurses at on the transplant floor said when David got out of the surgery, they all knew that David was going to sail through that surgery because of his attitude. Yeah. And he did. Yeah, he did. And then the other part of the recipe is just being grateful. I've never met a more grateful human being than David Sandlin. Um, In fact, it's so hilarious. We have three children between the two of us. They're all adults now. But raising our kids together in a blended family, David decided early on, you know, there's complaining here about this, complaining about this, you know, what kids do, you know, I mean, adults do it too. And so David just kind of came up with this little saying that became really irritating to everyone, including (laughs) me. You know, if I came home from a day at the office and it had gone not quite so smoothly and I was exhausted, maybe I had an encounter that wasn't so positive and I'm complaining about it. After I'd finally take a breath, David would say, Karen, 
are you thankful? Are you thankful? But are you thankful? It's like, oh, how irritating. Oh, I know. And so he would do <laughs> this with so kids. Annoying. But are you thankful? And so that just kind of became David Sandlin's signature phrase. But are you thankful? Because he knew that gratefulness really was the key to sustaining joy. And so David's lemonade recipe served him well. It served everyone in our family well. We've all just been richer as a result of being part of his life. And I shared the intricacies of his lemonade recipe. But here's what I didn't know, Andrew. I knew that I wanted to share what I've observed. What I didn't know is there's science behind being present and savoring, there's science behind using your mind as a tool, and there's science behind gratefulness. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Well, think I mean, about it's this. Very validating for sure, right? Yeah, but think about this. In in the '60s, there was a there was a stress test that was developed from some psychologists because they had made this connection that when we see people that are more stressed out, they tend to have more chronic illnesses. And so they came up with this stress test, and it's been used for years and years and years. I think it's called the Holmes and Rahi. I'm not looking at it, but I think that's it, Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S, and Rahi, R-A-H-E, stress test. And you can look it up online. There's actually a stress calculator that you can go online and test yourself. And what they were looking for in this 43 questionnaire is what is stress doing to predict chronic breakdown of some body health system in the next 24 months. So they had actually figured out that as the stressors rise in your life, there's also a direct correlation of health breakdown in body systems. And so I I actually just did the test recently before I went to give my lemonade course in Chicago. And my score was 366, which is ridiculously high. And so then if you look at that calculator, it predicts in the next 24 hours, I have an 80% chance of a health breakdown in my body. But that just tells me I also have a 20% chance that it won't. And so my commitment is to pour myself some lemonade every day and just reclaim my health and do everything I can to stay healthy and live in the spirit of David Sandlin. I love that so much. And I think that the, <laughs> that message is so incredibly powerful. We Two things that come, kind of come to mind for me. One is we all think that we have a rough life and then we hear this, you know, and it's just like, okay, let's, let's put our, our lives in perspective of, what was hard? Did the patient just get mad about our profi paste? Like that's right. there's a little splatter on on the cheek, and like they got <laughs> they got frustrated about like that. That's what we're gonna like you know have this you know emotional breakdown over. Or yeah, yeah. You know our doctor was a little bit stern because maybe they were going through something bad themselves, and they took it out on us, and they didn't know right. that they were doing it. And then, and we're gonna take that home now and kind of pass that on. And just mm-hmm. if you use this recipe, like you could just you could avoid so much personal heartache, and then also whatever you're passing on to everybody else. That is absolutely true. And just because we're on this topic, I I just want to tell you, I I made an observation about David and he had his own commercial construction company and that is not an easy field. I mean, dentistry is hard, but so is being a contractor, general contractor and trying to please everybody. And I, I just would notice that he would would separate stressors with his work from his personal life. And his way of doing it was to get up, walk away from his desk and go outside. David, I wish everybody could see our backyard. It is something, it's a work of art because David just manicured it. All I did was sit out there and drink coffee or drink wine and enjoy it. Um, (laughs) But that was his therapy. He would just get up and go outside because it would be a shift for his mind to not let that stressor dictate how he's going to navigate the rest of the day. And so one of the tips that I gave the audience in Chicago, because we all have such difficulty that at some point we'll come across our path. Uh, But when you're walking into your office, just physically look down at the doormat if you have one, if you don't, imagine one, and just decide when you cross that threshold, I'm going to be here, I'm going to be present for my patient today. And so not that that stuff isn't real, But then when you cross that threshold and you go home, wipe your feet again because you want to be present for your family. And it's not that there's not real things that happen that you may want to talk about, 
but tr- mm-hmm. make a decision. Be deliberate about how you let stressors affect your relationships with your patients, your colleagues, your friends, your family, and be on point about those three things, using your mind as a tool, being grateful, and savoring the good stuff. Because we all have so much more good than difficulty that comes across our path. Oh, that's beautiful. I don't know if you've seen recently, there was a, a study that was released that essentially, you know, everyone's working from home nowadays and all of, our, of the hygiene community is like, we want to work from home, we want to work from home. But the study was showing that the people who have a commute and it's a not a stressful commute, not a right. gridlock, you know, LA commute that we all think of, but when they have that opportunity to decompress for that 10 or 15 minutes, that that is so much more healthy that they can literally switch their, what you're saying, yeah. your clinician brain into yeah. your family brain or personal yeah. life brain, Right. then you're going to have a lot better outcomes. And it was really eye opening yeah. for me to see that because I'm like, I, unfortunately I'm working from home now. I'm like, well, crap, <laughs> I need to go somewhere. <laughs> like I need to have a threshold to step over. Or I need to have a yeah. backyard to yeah. open up, go out and, right. and completely clear my mind. Yeah. Hopefully I didn't, Hopefully I'm not getting too stressed though. I don't know. I don't feel like there's as much stress in my life though as there, as there used to be. So it feels good. But, oh, that's um, good. But yeah, that actually makes sense. Uh, I think yeah. decompression and just being deliberate about, I'm going to step away. I'm going to fill my mind, my brain, my body with really positive thoughts. So now's a moment to be grateful. I mean, Andrew, I headed out to Hawaii in January and David was supposed to be with me on that trip. And I had this gratefulness journal that I had bought and it was just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. And I I literally forced myself on the way to Hawaii to open it up and just with tears rolling down my face because he wasn't with me. um, I just forced myself to start writing what I'm grateful for. And I just, it was pages. It was just pages and pages Mm -hmm. and pages. And we all had that opportunity to shift even in the midst of, of some of the most difficult heartaches, we we have a choice. And that was my message to my audience. Making lemonade is not easy. It is a choice. I do believe it is a choice. And, and I'm going to be yeah. fully transparent. I don't struggle with anxiety. I don't struggle with depression. So I do recognize that there are people in this world that have a much more challenging reality to make the lemonade, but I still Mm -hmm. believe it's a choice. And I've seen the data. I've seen the science. The more we choose it, the more we move in and live in this space, the better our health is. And it actually reduces depression. It reduces anxiety to live Mm -hmm. in this space. Yeah. So I think, you know, one kind of question I I have, and I I don't expect you to maybe solve my problems for me, but... (laughs) I I have written or I've tried to have a, a gratitude journal or mm-hmm. at least, you know, some regular routine of writing out or even, you know, through prayer saying how thankful you are about things, yeah. how grateful you are. But where I have a hard time is unlocking that first one. And yeah. I don't know if you've ever come across that or if you ever had some audience members have the same issue. But if there's anything that any advice that you have for people like me or or someone else that you know, maybe is trying to unlock this. And and once you get going, what I've noticed is once I finally got past that, then it starts flowing out of you. But that is true. How do you get your brain and your feelings kind of aligned mm-hmm. to be able to create something like this? That's a really great question. I think that was part of my struggle sitting around here with that gratefulness journal. And I just, I had a hard time opening it and getting it started. Once I started, it was, it flowed. So two things I think that can be helpful I read in a book years ago about a woman that decided to write a thousand things she was grateful for. And Andrew, she had even the smell of the dryer sheet when she would put the clothes in the dryer because it smelled so good. It's like, yeah. well, I would, I would never really think, okay, I get, I get the idea. But I am grateful for that too, though. Right, yeah, I, I never right. thought about that. Yeah, yeah. so... I think one thing that can help all of us if we really want to gain some ground with that is just look around, open your eyes. And do, are you standing? <laughs> do you do you have two legs that are working? Do you, Are you able to smell the dryer sheet? Can you taste the delicious cheesecake that you just popped into your mouth? I mean, it, I think literally just being present and and appreciating where we are at that moment in time. There's always something to be thankful for, but there's also been some interesting data looking on the value of reminiscing. 
So we all have positive things in our life. And that's actually what started my journal when I wanted to reminisce about the things I was grateful for that I had experienced with David Sandlin firsthand. That's what started me. And that's why I went page after page after page. After page. So reminiscing can really be helpful or just looking around presently and just taking an inventory. Mm-hmm. What can I be grateful for that I see, that I feel, that I touch, that I smell right now? Karen, you are a wealth of knowledge. You speak on so many different things. I do want to have you back on. Uh, we talked kind of via email. I think it was autoimmune, right? Yeah. Like we're going to maybe talk yeah. about that maybe in the future. But any messages or any calls to action for our, our audience? They want you want you want them to come see you somewhere, speak or take a course. Oh wow! How can we help you? Well, thank you for that. My speaking career was kind of put on hold because I thought I was going to retire. I'm actually not fully retiring, but I am cutting back. So I don't have a real full schedule this year. I am in Toronto in May. I'm at the CDA in Northern California in September. I'm in Vermont in September. I'm in Dallas in August. That's actually all I have committed to for this year because I really wasn't planning on doing a lot, but I'm excited about those opportunities. Uh, But in in terms of a call to action, I I think I just want to encourage everyone, whether you're dealing with hard difficulty right now or it's coming your way and you you really don't even know it, maybe you're going to be blindsided by it. When difficulty comes our way, the the natural human instinct is to go down the, the line of what if, what if, what if. And we can kind of imagine the worst possible outcome. And one of the things that we learned early on in our journey, of course, ours was cancer. Everybody's journey is going to be different. But I do want to just pass this on because I think it can really help to settle a lot of that anxiety about the future. Go with what you know. Go with what you know. And what we knew at David's diagnosis is that we have today. We have right now. We do not know what the future holds. We don't know whether the treatment's going to work, whether it's not going to work, but we have right now. And so go with what you know can can be kind of a mindset that we can all just settle our hearts, settle our minds when we feel that blood pressure rising, when we're, we're really concerned about all the possible realities of what we're facing right now. And let's be honest, we all face some really tough stuff. Just go with what you know and then look at your lemonade recipe that worked so fabulously for David Sandlin. And it's the one I'm actually putting into practice right now with, I'll be honest, a little bit of limoncello along the way. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. That's a great addition. Karen, thank you so much for being on. I I love speaking with you. You're just... uh... Man, you make me want to be a better human being. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you for the opportunity to share this. It's so meaningful to me. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is a tale, a tale, oh yeah. A tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one, bringing the best of dental knowledge. And we do it all with ease. We cover oral health and screening and preventing gum disease. We're going to do a lot of learning and have a little bit of fun. Working at the tennis, a tale of two hygienists.